So now we're going to cover workflow. This is an overview of the process you go through in animation. This video will help you understand why we go through the steps on the DVD that we do. But first, I want to talk about two ways to approach animation. Straight ahead versus pose to pose. With straight ahead, you start on frame 1 and then you move forward in time, animating as you go. Here I'm using a bouncing ball as an example. So we're starting on frame 1 and just changing the ball's position over time. So we're beginning at the beginning and ending at the end. And this allows us to improvise. However, it easily gets out of hand and it's hard to track your progress as you move along. It also becomes messy and you have to go back and change things later. And those changes are hard to fix because you have lots of keyframes and it's hard to figure out what to do. So instead, with pose to pose, you start by asking, what are the main positions in this shot? These are called the keys. Here I have one key, the second key, and the third key. These are the main poses that we're using every time the ball hits the table. The next thing is that you define your breakdowns, which is how does the ball get from A to B to C. Here is one and here is the other breakdown. And now it's quite easy to fill in the blanks. So you can say with pose to pose you're making progressive refinement as you go. And the advantage is that it's planned, structured, clear and it's easy to time things and you don't need to go back and fix things later because you've planned them from the beginning. And so pose to pose is the technique we'll be using in most of the examples on this DVD. However, you should be aware that there is a third way of doing animation. I only use this on very complicated shots, but it's really a combination of the two. Essentially, you do two passes of animation. First, you define the keys, then you insert the breakdowns, but instead of just filling in the blanks, you then go back to frame one and start all over, doing a straight ahead pass on top. This technique has been advocated by 2D animators over time. And also, this is just like stop motion or claymation. In fact, this is the only way that stop motion animators can really animate because they can't go back and put a piece of clay in between two other positions. They really have to do straight ahead and so they do two passes. The advantage for 3D animators is that you can enhance the flow of the animation although for most things it's not really needed because with 3D animation applications like Blender you can fix the flow of animation at the end. Watching this DVD You'll get used to the idea that animation is all about planning. The more you plan, the easier it gets. This is often referred to as the long shortcut, because if you've planned things well enough, you don't have to go back and fix them later. And you end up spending far less time than if you just plunged into it. Now let me take you through the steps you'll go through for a typical character animation shot. We'll go through five steps. The first one is paper and pencil. And you might say this sounds unnecessary, but I find it an important step because it forces you to plan. And this is where you get all the ideas. You ask yourself what will happen and how will it happen? And you must be absolutely clear about what you want to achieve. Otherwise, it will be nearly impossible to do it. This is also where you define the acting and of course you can use video or record yourself in the mirror to get ideas. But we'll talk more about acting in the later episode. You can also use computer software instead of a pencil. But you'll find there's a much more direct path from the brain to your hand to the pencil. And from the brain to the hand to the keyboard and mouse to the user interface and to the functions you want to perform. That's why I recommend getting out a real piece of paper and a pencil. My idea for this tutorial is to do a simple baseball scene. 
It's a simple action that can demonstrate the steps that we go through. These are the drawings that I did for my shot. As you can see, they're very messy, but it doesn't really matter because they're only for you. And they allow you to experiment with different poses and different ways of doing the shot. It's also very cheap to experiment because unlike in 3D, you can easily rub things out and change things. If you find it hard to get ideas for how to do the shot, you can look at yourself in the mirror or you can even record yourself with video and try different things out. Before you move on to the next step, you should have a clear idea of what you want to accomplish. And now we can turn on the computer and do step two, which is the block. And here we're finally moving into 3D. You can refer to your thumbnails and plot in each main pose. It's very important that you get these poses right at this stage because it's hard to change them radically later. So take your time and make sure you have exactly what you want. I'm using constant interpolation in Blender, which means that the computer isn't trying to fill in the blanks between the keyframes. You can see that these different poses are on the screen for exactly the same amount of time. At the bottom, this white line represents time, and each diamond represents a pose. Now let's move on to the third step, which is timing. Here, I'm taking the same poses, but then offsetting them in time. Now you can see I've given the part where he's preparing a lot more time, and I've made the hit very quick. Good timing can be hard, but you can refer to video material or also look at yourself in the mirror and see what you do. Now, let's talk about the breakdown. The breakdown is an often overlooked step, but it's very important for defining the movements of your characters. It defines how you go from one pose to another. And here I'm turning on linear animation. And you'll see I've added a little bit more definition to how he picks up the club in the beginning and also how he does the swing and settles at the end. I'm still keyframing all the bones inside of the character. And here at the bottom, you can see that the breakdowns are represented in purple. And I've added a breakdown in between almost all of the yellow keys. The animation is still very robotic, however, so we'll fix that in the finaling step. Now, I've turned on Bezier curves, and I've added more drawings or poses, as you might say, to fix the arcs and add a little bit more overlapping action, also smoothing things out and just giving it the right amount of snap. I've also added in some moving holes when he prepares to shoot, which means that the character doesn't stand completely still. And here at the bottom, you'll see there are keyframes now on almost every frame. And that's fine because we've done things very structured. So all these things I'm fixing and adding in, I won't have to go back and change later. And just for fun, I've added a rendered version. The great thing about rendering it out is we can add motion blur, which just add a little bit more realism to the scene. And now to recap. This is the block, just the basic poses with equal timing. And now, the timing part, we're timing the pose, giving it the right spacing in between each pose. With the breakdown, we're adding more definition, how does it get between each keyframe? And finally, adding polish. And now, I'm just going to show you the 12 principles of animation. These were developed at Disney, and we won't go through these slavishly, but actually they're great as a checklist. These are things to look out for in your animation. You can put them on your wall and refer to them when you're reviewing your own animations. So let's talk about setting up in Blender. The first thing you want to do is make sure you have a suitable screen layout. I have a 3D view in the middle and a timeline at the bottom, which is obviously very important for animation. On the left, I have an outliner and a buttons window below it. 
On the right, I have the Action Editor and the IPO Editor below it for modifying keyframes and curves. Now, of course, you don't have to set it up like this. Lots of people have their own preferences, but this works great for animation because you have everything you need visible. And you can easily make the animation editors larger to work on keyframes or make the 3D view bigger to work on the poses. I have another tip, which is that you can make any window full screen temporarily. This is great if you're working away on your keyframes and quickly want to check the 3D view full screen, or if you simply want to completely maximize something you're working on. When hovering the cursor over any screen, press Control down arrow. Now let's talk about how to manage your shots. So let's say you're working on a little short project involving a number of shots with characters. How do you set this up? Your immediate thought might be to create a Blender file and start working away until you've made all the shots in the scene. In the end, you have one file containing everything. However, this is impractical. It's much better to separate things out a little bit so that you have one file per shot because it makes it much easier to manage and you only deal with what you need for each shot and you won't mess anything else up. It may sound like a hassle, but it makes everything a lot cleaner and it's much easier to focus. But then you might say, it's great to have things separated, but what happens if I change a character in one file, the others won't get updated? Well, that's why you have linked groups. In one shot file, you can link in the character, the set, the props, and even the script and compositing nodes. And this makes it much easier to deal with multiple shots and scenes. It also makes it much easier to collaborate with multiple people because each person can be working away on their little part. Now let me focus on the relationship between the character and a few shots. The problem here is that even though you're linking in the character, you want the movements to be unique for each shot. You don't want it to move the same way, of course. So what you do is you tell Blender to make the actions local in each file. This is also referred to as proxifying. And in a minute, I'll show you how to do it in Blender. The shortcut is Control alt p I also have some tips about how to organize your layers. This will help you make it a little easier to manage all your assets. Here are Blender's 20 layers. First, we'll focus on the first 10 ones. Let's say you have one character in your shot. We'll put this on layer 1. It's extremely useful to be able to hide the bones away from the characters, so let's put these underneath it. And the great thing about organizing it like this is that we can put the remaining characters side by side, and each character has their respective bones on the layer underneath it. Now, let's move on to the next 10 bones. Here you can put your lamps, your cameras, and also your scene data. If you have a complex set, this can fill up multiple layers. I also like to have a trash can on the last layer, where I put temporary things and stuff I'm not quite sure about. Now, I want to show you how to set up a file in Blender with linked characters and organize them into layers. This is an empty Blender file. And before we do any importing, we have to save this current file because for the linking to work, Blender needs to know where all the files you're working on are. Go to File, Save As, and here, I have a folder full of my characters or rigs. Underneath, I've created a folder called Shots. And I'll put a file in there called Shot1. I'll hit Save As. And now I'm ready to import the characters. I'll go back to File, Append or Link. And then, I'll navigate to the folder called Rigs where the characters are. I'll select Biped Rig. To import the whole character, go to Group and select Biped Rig. This makes sure that you have everything associated with the characters. Then, make sure you're linking and not appending. And also, make sure you have relative paths enabled. 
which means that Blender remembers the relationship between the files you're working on, even if you move them somewhere else on your computer or even on a completely different one. I'll hit Load Library. Before we proceed, I'll delete the default cube. But you'll notice that the character we imported isn't visible in the scene yet. That's because even though we've referenced the other file, we still have to add that group into our scene. So I'll go to the top view, hit the space bar and go to Add Group, and there you see the character that we linked to. I'll select Biped Rig, and now you can see the character has appeared in our scene. You'll also see that we can't make any changes to him, because he's simply linked into our scene. So to make the bones editable, I'll proxify it by hitting Ctrl Alt P. Now I'll get a list of all the objects associated with the group. The part we want to proxify is the rig. So I'll select rig from the pop-up list. And now you can see the rig has become editable. If we go to pose mode, we can start to select different body parts and move them around. I'll put the bones on a separate layer, so I'll hit M and put the bones on the layer underneath. Now we can view the character and the bones independently of each other. And if we shift click on the layers, we can view them together. Let's add some more characters. Go to File, Append or Link, and then navigate out of the biped rig. And let's load Man Candy. We'll select Man Candy, go to Group, and then Man Candy. Again, remember to link and also remember to have relative paths enabled. Hit Load. Again, we'll go to the top view, hit Spacebar, and select Add Group Man Candy. And you'll see Man Candy is a little bit bigger than our other rig, but that's not a problem. We can simply scale him down. And I'll just move him over to the side here. Again, we'll hit Control Alt P. And we get a list of the objects associated with Man Candy. I'll select Man Candy Scale. Again, we'll move the bones on a separate layer. Hit OK. We'll also move the Man Candy character on the layer above the bones. Now we can look at both our characters separately and also enable or disable the bones if we need it. To make the view a little less cluttered, we can go to the View menu and select View Properties and then Disable Relationship Lines. This just cleans up things a little bit. Now we can start posing our second character. And remember that both of these characters are linked into this file, so if we make any changes in the original character files, they get updated here completely automatically. And that's all. Hopefully you have a good idea about the process of animation and how to organize things in Blender. Thanks.